fourth JLM, uh, the fourth JLF we participate in. So we started in Warsaw and we started like with smaller programs and then we started going really big. Um, and this program, actually, well, this is a smaller JLF and and this time we've had um, three weeks. So this is what what is interesting. Like we have a large alumni base and we mobilized our like 150 alumni from previous years and we co-designed well, all the session together, it's always, we try to have like really inclusive processes, so um, we we did this on, on Facebook and first we started asking like, what do we want? Like, do we want just a brainstorm or do we want, um, what what is the objective that we're looking for? And we came up with promoting innovation and real solutions, so that's something that we're going to do now. And the problem that we wanted to tackle again, like we asked everybody and we got a lot of different ideas. We got integration, inter, intergenerational inequality. We had engaging youth and GLF model. We had rural migration of youth and the great disconnection to processes that happen. So um, that's why in the end, well, a lot of different suggestions were made. And we voted for the most popular one, which was uh, disconnection to interconnection. So it's a bit, a, bit, a bit of a mix of all the recommendations that were made. The role of youth in shifting perceptions and presenting solutions to rural to urban migration. So with this, um, we also needed to know who we were going to address this to, so that we would, know, we would need to know how to do it. That was David's idea. Um, and our targets are international government agencies, there are policymakers, there are researchers there, everybody who might work with rural to urban migration that we could, um, we could work with them to address this issue. Um, so the way we are going to structure this is first we're going to have a few speakers that are going to present um, some like their their case studies um, with migration. Sorry about this paper. <laughs> um, and then we're going to have a, um, a discussion. We're going to split into groups. Um, after David will also explain a little bit. By the way, um, I'd like to present David. Um, he's been uh, a big like big brain of, of this session, and like he's helped us a lot. Just. Um, designing this um, and also he's a great facilitator uh, but you'll see that in a while so um, we're gonna break up into different breakup groups and we're going to discuss uh, the issues that you will see from the well, videos and presentations that will be coming up shortly and then just the wrap up um, and here we'll have well David will explain this later but the facilitators who have been part of the facilitation workshop that happened yesterday um, so, first up, we will be looking at experiences from people uh, who have migrated from rural to urban areas and also people who have migrated back to, to rural areas and, and why. And um, we're going to see like, what these challenges are and like, how to overcome the challenges that, that may cause these or, or, or that are linked to, this, to the subject. And the solution to this design challenge will be like, through dialogue, and participation, conversation between a diverse group of actors. So like, as you can see, there's a lot of young people, but there's also people who, can also, who have experience with this and who can maybe help with their own points of view in making this more of an integral process. So I would like to invite our first speaker, who is Daniela. And she's going to talk to you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank, you for, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I'm Daniela Rivas, uh, and I'm from Peru. Currently, I'm the control representative for, for the, young, the Young Professional for Agricultural Development, WIPER. Uh, I'm also alumni from 2014 and 2015 uh, Jodin Landscape Initiative, so it's really like being home. Uh, it feels uh, like being here. I'm so glad to introduce you a couple of histories, uh, both coming from rural, from rural Peru, from two totally different landscapes. 
uh, the first one from the Amazonia and the other one from the Andes, our highlands. These are not extraordinary uh, histories, at, at least in my country, but they come from extraordinary people who migrate from rurality to achieve a better education in Lima, which is the capital city of my country. Uh, therefore, I bet this audience in particular is going to feel connect within what they have to say. At the final, we will present some comments uh, of, of, from rural elders, and I hope you, you can enjoy it. Thank you. Hola, me llamo Rosemary Daza, eh, soy de Perú, soy ingeniera zootecnista. Yo nací en Moyobamba, toda mi niñez y adolescencia la viví allá. Cuando terminé el colegio decidí venir a Lima para poder estudiar una carrera. Lamentablemente en Moyobamba, en el tiempo cuando yo terminé el colegio, que es en el año 2002, no existían universidades, menos una universidad que, que tenga la carrera de ingeniería zootecnista. Yo he vivido desde muy pequeño en una granja, mi papá es ganadero y ellos se quedaron a cargo de la granja. Lamentablemente en Insola, cuando estuve aquí en Lima, en los primeros meses fue muy frustrante para mí. La diferencia en, en educación de, de Lima y Moyobamba es abismal. Poco a poco fui aprendiendo, eh, preparándome, me costó mucho, sí, porque no tenía la, la educación básica, digamos, ¿no? Este, una vez que ingresé a la agraria, eh, decido ir en mis vacaciones a Moyobamba para poder contribuir o ver todo lo que aprendía en clase, lo, lo plasmaba en el campo. Estuve dos meses por allá, ayudando a mi papá con la ganadería, que tiene un sabro lechero, tiene cultivos de caña de azúcar, eh, cultivos de cacao. Entonces, he crecido en ese mundo, he crecido siempre en, en ese mundo del campo. Mi vida Siempre ha sido um, estar rodeada de animales, de plantas y vivir en, en la armonía con la naturaleza. Los demás de mis amigos lamentablemente no pudieron eh, estudiar en una universidad, eh, allá solamente había institutos. Eh, bueno, o se dedicaron al comercio, ¿no? ya sea de ropa, comercio de café, de cacao, etc. Siempre le he pasado bien, tengo muy buenos recuerdos allá en Moyobamba, incluso extraño vivir allá. Extraño mucho vivir allá en Moyobamba y nada, yo me gustaría que todo el mundo conociera Moyobamba. Hola, mi nombre es Emerson Jaime Guamán, soy de departamento de Huancabelica, provincia de Ayacaja, del distrito de Cubamba, de la comunidad campesina de Yanania. Voy a contar un poco de que soy estudiante de Lima, en primer lugar. Y cuál ha sido la ruta para llegar a, para estudiar en Lima. Cuando estaba en cuarto grado de colegio, y vi a, mi, a un profesor que... Y yo escuchaba al profesor de que hablaba Huancayo, eh, Lima, es, hay bastante educación. La educación es el doble, el triple de lo que estamos haciendo acá. Yo escuchaba eso y yo dije, pero voy a ir algún día. Y a ese algún día se hizo en dos años. Cuando terminé el colegio, con la ayuda de Beca 18, llegué a escenificar eh, lo que yo tanto esperaba, porque yo quería comprobar o sea, cómo es ese, ese nivel de educación en Lima. Cuando llegué a Lima, todo era diferente. Era bastante diferente entre estar en el campo y estar en la ciudad. Cuando llegué nomás, eh, como si estaba solito. O sea, estaba triste, yo varias veces lamentándome que porque decidí venir a Lima, llorando a veces por las tardes porque siempre extrañaba de tu mami, de mi, de mi papá, de jugar con mis, 
de mis, con, con mis compañeros. Eh, o sea, fue bastante tristeza para mí los, tres, los primeros tres meses. A partir de los tres meses, ahí recién un poquito a soltarme, eh, o sea, un poco a relajarme. Yo, a, a los primeros meses, yo quería volverme a mi comunidad. Como sea, regresar a mi comunidad, porque no me adaptaba. Era, me, me, me ha chocado bastante. Cuando estaba en la universidad, eh, las cosas eran bastante diferentes. Este, mis compañeros con los que no me relacionaba y con los que me relacionaba me trataban diferente, o sea, uno porque no sabía muy bien, porque en el colegio no me formaron como debe ser, porque los profesores son de la comunidad misma, no son profesionales de Lima ni de Huancayo. Eh, eso, eso fue uno de los factores, o sea, no sabía muy bien el tema de matemáticas, de lengua, de, de otras, no sabía y cuando armábamos grupos para desarrollar algún trabajo, me excluía. Eso fue en el primer ciclo y en el segundo ciclo. Yo siempre... Eh, me he proyectado así metas casi imposibles, o imposibles no porque yo sí lo voy a hacer, ¿no? Eh, o sea, mi proyección fue siempre alto, salir a otros países, y por eso llegué a Lima justamente, ahora que tengo 18 años, y próximos años posiblemente voy a ir a otros países. Con todos estos proyectos que hay ahora en el municipio, ya la gente no trabaja, ¿no? Todo es... Allá 70 lucas la tarea, acá les pagas 30, 35, ya no quieren. ¿Sus hijos qué han estudiado o qué quieren estudiar? No, mi hija ha estudiado administración bancaria. Totalmente diferente. Ya. Y mi otra hija está estudiando, pero es zootecnia, no está estudiando economía. Ah. Zootecnia. Pero también te gusta el, el campo. El campo no, sino lo que es animales, eso. Ya la cultura de nosotros no es ya. Ya sus hijos, pues, la hija de ella también ya se va a Lima. Ya. Difícil que, que van con mi madre. ¿no? Sí, y ustedes como padres les hubiera gustado que sus hijos continúen las labores en la sala en la agricultura? Por parte sí, por parte no. O sea, sí, Porque la agricultura es bien difícil. Grande, sí, pero no, que se vayan a estudiar y se perfeccionen y vengan con otras ideas. Porque la agricultura es una rama tan amplia que nunca termina de aprenderla total. No, no. El campo es difícil. Es sacrificado y no, no, no hay buena remuneración. La verdad, los agricultores estamos cada vez peor. Thank you, Daniela. So, um, we can see some of the challenges that were presented here, right? Um, So why, why do people migrate? What pushes them out of places? And how can we address these, these challenges to like, make people stay? Because not all of them uh, like, want to leave. Or what is making us lose the connection to like, our roots and nature? And, and why are we not finding these, these um, opportunities like, appealing anymore? That's like, maybe the, the big question that we're We're trying to address um, with this. So, with my our next speaker is also a youth and landscapes alumni, and it's let please correct me where where are you? I'm There you here. are. It, let correct me if, if I'm uh, pronouncing your your last name right. So it's Arman Golrokian. Perfect. Arman from Iran. So it rhymes. <laughs> That came up yesterday. But please share your experiences with. So much. All right. How's everyone feeling? It's been a long day. There's so many other, so many good uh, conversations this morning. Uh, so this is my one of my favorite conferences. I'm so happy to be invited, and I'm so uh, excited to speak to you as a youth alumni or a youth retired. Uh, feel so old. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. Thanks for coming to the session. Um, so before I get into the details of my own story, I would like to uh, tell you a little bit more about the, the reason of uh, this session, because migration doesn't necessarily stop climate change. But uh, the reason that we're focusing on is, uh, the reason we're focusing on migration is because that allows people who are experiencing a lot of pain and suffering to get away from the impact of climate change. And that is something that we need focus on in the coming years to have an open mind and open arms to 
uh, have people who are escaping from their homes because of climate change, we need to be more open-minded and accept them very warmly. Um, so with the, rise of, with the raise of hand, I would like to see how many of you have migrated in your life for different reasons, for like education, for going to college, universities, or for job opportunities if you've got a job in a different city or country, or for someone you've met, family with your love or something. Can I see how many of you have migrated? Awesome, that's great. So uh, it seems there's a lot of experience at the table. Uh, I look forward to a rich conversation at the end. Uh, so I have 10 minutes to share the story of my life as someone who has migrated twice, once uh, domestically and once internationally. Uh, I'm from Iran and I came from Iran to the US. Um, and I will discuss that how my personality has been impacted by migration. And I will talk about a couple of snapshots in my life. Uh, I will discuss about those. So I want to summarize my story in one sentence. Uh, it's open borders, open minds. As I said, we need to open the borders, political borders, and also we need to open our minds. Um, and this is something I truly believe that in the highly globalized world of today, where products, information, ideas cross the borders so easily, there's no way that we can uh, stop people from uh, moving around. So let's get to my story. Um, I'm from Iran, uh, and I spent 18 years of my life in Shiraz, which is one of the most beautiful cities in Iran. Uh, when I got to the age for going to college, I moved to Tehran, the capital of Iran with almost 10 million uh, population. It's a very big city, and it was a big transformation. Um, I started studying mechanical engineering, and I focused on energy systems. Uh, soon I realized that uh, I, I'm interested in non-technical components of energy, like such as policy, economics, social and environmental issues of uh, energy systems. And uh, for graduate degrees, I was looking for opportunities to focus on these interdisciplinary topics. Um, excuse me. A very well established in Iran, and nor in many other countries in the world. So there are very few universities all around the world that focus on these cross-disciplinary topics. Uh, I was lucky enough to be accepted at the University of Michigan. Uh, so I had to move again from Iran to Michigan. Uh, and this opportunity, I'm so grateful for that. I've been given so many resources and opportunities at the U of M, and I've been taking advantage of all of those. Uh, and now looking back at my life, I can say I wouldn't be the person who I am if I wouldn't migrate and if I wouldn't come if I wouldn't have migrated twice. So the reason that I'm here is I, I truly believe that's because of these opportunities that are being given. So to discuss the impact of migration on my personality, uh, I would like to flash back three years back, uh, three years from now. Uh, imagine August 2013 uh, that I got off the plane in Detroit with two suitcases and a uh, backpack on my shoulder. Um, very sad because I got away from all the things that I loved, from my family, friends, all of the childhood memories and all the attachments that I had in Iran. And I came into somewhere that I had no idea about. I had no friends, uh, no attachments to Michigan, and uh, I had no idea even where I'm going to sleep at the night. That was very risky. I just got into the U.S. without even knowing where I'm going to stay for the night. Um, and. To be honest, I was raised in Iran under the assumption that Iran and the U.S. are enemies. So I expected that to, this pre-assumption to impact my life on a daily basis. Uh, I was expecting some animosity and some uh, getting bullied on a daily basis in the U.S. But that was totally wrong. Uh, that turns out to be completely wrong. I've experienced. I had really good experience in the U.S. Um, I've made so many friends that I like them as much as I like my Iranian friends, and they like me a lot too. I hope so. <laughs> uh, for 
the purpose of this conversation, we can assume that that's, that's true. I know that I, I expect that after this conversation, my Twitter and Facebook is going to explode with messages like, we don't like you, don't. <laughs> but yeah, that's a, that's a, I take that as a joke. Uh, so that was, that was the experience that I had in the past three years in the US that changed my mindset and the way that I look at the world. Um, and when we flash forward to now, uh, I believe that uh, majority of Iranian and, Amer and Americans can get along very well if they're given an opportunity to interact and to get to know each other. Um, I should be, as it should be clear by now, I'm a, a big fan of migration. Uh, migration in the context of climate change is sometimes being seen as a problem. People migrating from rural areas to the cities and putting a lot of pressure on the city's infrastructure, the energy, transportation, water, housing systems. Uh, but to look at the bright side, there's a big opportunity for having, raising awareness and educating people who migrate to those cities for those better lives and for those opportunities, and they can then they can go back and serve their communities. So I'm totally a big fan of migration. And uh, it, is, it is very wrong. You can't force people to stay in a region if they don't want to. Uh, by doing that, we are making cities and countries like prisons. You know, forcing people to stay somewhere that they don't want to, and uh, they get uh, basically tortured by natural disasters and losing their job and losing, not having food and not having opportunities. So uh, opening borders is an essential thing in today's world. Uh, personally, migration is, is more of a long-term commitment, but uh, traveling is another opportunity for opening people's mind. Uh, and that's, uh, I've made a personal commitment, like the INDCs, you know, the countries have nationally determined contribution, and my personal INDC is 30 by 30, to travel to 30 countries by the age of 30. Uh, Morocco is 18 countries, so I have 12 more in the next three years. Uh, that's very ambitious, especially when you're holding an Iranian passport. Uh, uh, so even my presence here today was jeopardized by my Iranian passport, which I'm very proud of, don't get me wrong, but uh, I would like you to think, when did you finalize your plans to be here? Like three months ago, I don't know, two months ago, uh, two weeks ago, just keep that in your mind. My flight was on Saturday at 2.50 p.m., and I picked up my passport at the post office at 11.45, like three hours before my flight. And I just got on the car, got to the airport, and it felt like the Titanic movie, like being the last person jumping on the airplane to be here. Uh, and I'm so grateful for being here, and thanks, thanks for having me. Uh, so there are, when you look back in your personal life, you can see there are a lot of good moments and bad moments. Uh, migration has allowed me to have a lot of good moments, a lot of good memories, a lot of opportunities, but there are really sad moments that are tied to my uh, migration. And uh, from that you can see that why I'm so committed to, uh, to this idea. I have only one sibling, one sister, uh, and she got married last year and I wasn't able to be there. And uh, you can see that that was the saddest moment of my life. And it's, it was all about because of this ridiculous visa and passport uh, constraint. So to wrap up and conclude, um, let's talk about future and be more optimistic. We are the youth uh, in the past couple of weeks after election and all those things. I've seen a lot of youth being very disappointed and pessimistic. but. The asset that we have is our energy and our hope. So let's talk about future. Um, I get this question all the time that, do you want to go back to Iran or do you want to stay? And I don't have a clear cut answer for that. Um, I haven't made my mind. I really want to go back and serve my community and serve, help people plan and adapt to climate change. Because climate change is the most pressing issue of our time. And as far as I know, Iran needs a lot of assistance in that uh, context. But on the other hand, the issue for me is having the impact, being able to do something to have the highest impact on the, on the globe. Uh, and, I won't, and I won't have that much resources and opportunities if I go back. 
so this is a dilemma that I have to deal with, and I'm sure most of our generation are thinking about. Because we are more of the global citizens, if you look at it in this context, we are less dependent and less tied to a piece of land than our parents or our grandparents. Uh, as, you meant, as you showed me with the raise of hand, there's a majority of us in this room who have been traveling all around and migrated because of, uh, because of different opportunities or forces in our life. <clears throat> and uh, when you look from the climate perspective, if you look from 70,000 feet above the ground, it doesn't really matter where the carbon is coming from, whether from Iran or the US. So anywhere that you can have the highest impact is uh, it's going to serve the climate change issue the same way. Um, the, and this mentality that I was talking about is not peculiar to me. It's, it's the generation that I'm representing that uh, we all look at the world in a different way than our parents. Uh, if you are all more a global citizen and we all feel belong to protecting the earth. Uh, so I would like to leave you in, with one message uh, that is the summary of basically my life. <laughs> That's my life wisdom <laughs> for you. It's open borders and open minds and that is essential. This is something that we, in the climate negotiation, that is something that needs to be focused more. Uh, as I said, there's the, the current refugee problem in the world is just a couple hundred thousands of people are moving. But because of climate change, we're, we should expect millions of climate refugees. And our societies are not ready for that. Uh, you can see that everyone wants to build a wall. On, the 20, on November 9th, a couple days ago, on the 27th anniversary of the fall, uh, fall of Berlin Wall, American people voted for someone who wants to, who wants to build a wall. And we can see that how our societies are against migration and are not ready to openly accept the people who are losing their homes, losing their jobs, and they cannot leave there. Hopefully, they, they, are, be, they are able to move. They are able to leave their country, and they're not going to stay and die in their country. Uh, thank you so much, and I look forward uh, to a great conversation at the end of this panel. So how, how do we open these borders and how do we open minds, right? And sometimes it's easy to forget that's also why it's this lack of connection that we're talking about. Like sometimes we forget that people who migrate, they're not just migrants, they're people. So how to open our minds about this? So that's a very good point. So our third speaker is unfortunately not here, but he sent us a video. So um, well, I'll be showing you Dili Prata's uh, video, and he heads NOMAD, which is a World Bank initiative um, that organizes data and, and knowledge on, on migration. So, um, I am Dili Prata. I will share some thoughts on migration and uh, how it can be a great vehicle for sharing prosperity between places, in particular between, let's say, the richer communities, richer places, and the poorer places and the poorer communities. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to share a few words about myself. I grew up in a village, a remote village in India. I studied in a village school until high school. And um, uh, at that time, there was no running water, there was no electricity. And um, uh, then I had to go to, for college to another city. And uh, when I finally went for my uh, master's in uh, Delhi, uh, the train ride was about uh, 36 hours uh, long. So it was a far um, journey for me in many ways. And while working in the uh, university, I mean, while, while studying in the university, I actually had to work. So I was doing private uh, tuition, giving uh, you know, tuition to uh, high school students to support my uh, stay while, while uh, doing my master's. I came to the US uh, as a student 
26 years ago. That's uh, about half of my life uh, that uh, I have been here. And soon I'll be outside India uh, longer than I have been in India. I met my wife here in Washington, D.C. and we have two wonderful sons. When my elder son was uh, six or seven, I asked him once uh, what he was. And he said, half Indian, half Venezuelan, and full American. Uh, he couldn't count at that time. Um, like most of the migrants, I have, I have been sending remittances to my family and um, uh, back home in India. And also my wife seems, uh, was sending remittances to Venezuela, where she is from. And uh, we both remain deeply interested in helping our communities back home, like most of the migrants. So with that, uh, I wanted to also mention that uh, this story of uh, migration is not unique to me. You know, it's a story of humanity. There are 250 million international migrants. There are 750 million internal migrants. So that's about 1 billion people as migrants. Uh, that's one out of seven people on the planet as migrants. Um, these uh, international migrants send home about $440 billion in remittances to developing countries. $440 billion per year is actually more than three times the size of the total development aid. So you can imagine the importance of uh, uh, migration to the communities back home. The internal migrants also send money home. A large part of their incomes that they earn in richer places, they send it back home. And it's a great way of sharing prosperity between richer places and the poorer places. Uh, we don't have a number for internal, internal remittances, domestic remittances. Now, with the fact that one out of seven people in the planet are, are migrants, it's no wonder that sustainable development goals actually included two migration related goals, actually more than two, but two are worth pointing out. Uh, one is to reduce remittance costs to less than 3% by 2030, and in no corridor, remittance costs should be more than 5%. So that is one goal. A second goal is to reduce recruitment costs for low-skilled migrants. So these are two goals that are part of the sustainable development goals. On the first goal, on reducing remittance costs, it is uh, worth pointing out that it costs about 8% on average globally to send money home. So uh, if you're sending, let's say, $100 from uh, New York to India, then on the other side, most likely the person will receive about $95, $96, uh, on average about $92 only. If one is sending money from, let's say, New York to Nairobi, $100 from New York to Nairobi, then on the other side, most likely the person will receive only $90. Sending money to Sub-Saharan Africa is actually the, among the most expensive. It is more than 10% on average. And within Africa, where migration, <coughs> uh, international migration in Africa is mostly intra-African migration. People migrate from one country to another. Two-thirds of international migration in Africa is actually in, in intra-African migration. There, intra-African remittances are also large, and sending money from one African country to another African country can cost even more than 20%. So what can we do to reduce remittance costs? Uh, three ways. One is to introduce better technology, in particular internet-based technology, or mobile phone-based technology. Mobile phone-based technology actually promises, um, this is very promising. Uh, that is one way. The second way is to break down any exclusive partnership that exists between national post office system of a country and a leading money transfer company. That actually, that kind of exclusive partnership 
excludes other money transfer agencies, reduces competition, and enables the money transfer company to, to charge a very high fee. So that's the second way of reducing remittance costs, to do away with exclusive partnerships between national post office and a money transfer company. A third way of reducing remittance costs would be to recognize that small remittances are not money laundering, that there is no need to go after all small remittance transactions for the fear that they either facilitate money laundering or that they are all out there for financing terrorism. That is just rubbish. So we need to do more work to persuade regulators and commercial banks out there that small remittances are not money laundering. The second goal of reducing recruitment costs for low-skilled migrants, it is not properly recognized by people, but it is pervasive. It is the dark underbelly of every modern city in the world. I just had news again from my part of India that there is pervasive problem of uh, uh, modern day slavery in the sense that the recruitment agents who are helping big construction companies in the cities for the big constructions that is going on in the growing economy, they give loans to poor people in rural areas with the promise that they will take them afterwards to the cities and where they would work and they would pay back the money and often they underpay them, they exploit them, and it is truly the modern day slavery. There was one incident where 13 villagers from near my village, they were taken to, they were promised a job somewhere in the south of India, and instead, when the time came, they were taken to the north, towards a city in the north of India. When they were going, out of the 13, 11 villagers managed to escape, two were caught, and the recruitment agents actually chopped off the, the hands of the people. They asked the question, you know, you are not going to work for anybody else, so would you let us cut your leg or would you let us cut your hand? And the two persons who were actually uncle and, and, and a nephew, they talked among themselves. And the uncle said, if we have, have our legs, we can at least walk to safety. So they said, please chop our hands. And there are pictures on the internet you can see with their hands chopped off these two people. This problem of modern day slavery, malpractice, abuse of migrant workers is playing out in a smaller scale in uh, the case of, let's say, low skilled construction workers, domestic workers, and agricultural workers. An example, in the case of a Bangladesh migrant looking for a job in the construction sector in Dubai, the person often pays $4,000 to $5,000 in recruitment costs. These are all illegal. They pay that fee to a labor agent who finds them the job. The job on the other side in Dubai pays about $1,800 in a year. If the person has paid $4,000 and is going to earn about $1,800 per year, then it would take about two years or more just to pay back the recruitment fees to the labor agents, all of which is illegal. You can imagine the hardship that these people face, the uh, vulnerability that these people face. This should be a low-hanging fruit. We should be able to declare all such costs as illegal. And what would be some of the ways to go after that? Well, we have to better monitor recruitment agencies. We have to have the law in place to start with. And if the laws are there, then we have to monitor the laws um, more effectively and enforce the law. The second is to educate the migrants about their rights. Third is to make sure that contracts are properly honored, respected. There are proper contracts to start with. And third, uh, and the fourth is when uh, the two countries on both sides, the sending country and the receiving country, they pay attention to these poor people who often fall below the radar screen. Um, this is, as I said, not specific to any particular country. This is really the dark underbelly of every modern city in the world. So with that, um, I um, 
want to again uh, highlight that uh, over 90% of migration is for economic purposes. In other words, it is for uh, a person who is looking for a job, it's an employer who is, who is willing to offer the job. In that sense, migration is mostly beneficial to the migrant and also to the employer. Indeed, um, migration is an integral part of development. Economic growth involves some places, some sectors that are growing faster. It involves some places, some sectors that are lagging behind. And there is that need for people to move from lagging places, lagging sectors, to leading sectors and leading places. Migration and development are inseparable. We should recognize that. And I would say that we should also recognize that development efforts should focus on people, not on places alone. Thank you. points. I don't know if you agree with me. I think that was quite insightful. Um, so definitely um, development and, and, and migration, they go hand in hand. They cannot be separated. And it's, it's also well interesting how, how these issues with all of these different issues is with remittances, with how 90% of, of, of migration um, reasons are economic reasons, like what is being offered in one place that is not being offered in the other one? How can we address this? So with this, I leave you to David, who will be facilitating this next portion of our session. Thank you, Ty. All right, we've got 30 minutes now. Um, so what we're going to try and do in the next 30 minutes, you all are sat in round tables. This is unique for this room during today. So um, what we're going to try and do is do a speed design session. We're going to try and get as far along a design process as we can. So how is that going to run? Well, first, we're going to, on your tables, talk through what some of the common features and challenges, common features as challenges, from all of the three uh, different sets of stories that we've heard. Okay, so we've heard three different stories from three, di three different perspectives. Common challenges is the first stage of the design process. Once you've identified a challenge, could you tell me what success looks like in solving that challenge? So let's, let's jump straight from a challenge to what does success look like? What does it look like once, I, once, once this challenge has gone away? And then the third stage of that design process, and this should be a speed design process because we've got 30 minutes, is, okay, so we know what success looks like. What's our solution for getting there? Okay, so what I'm going to ask for you, it's, it's 5 o'clock, we've been here, it's a long day, but we need 30 minutes of energy. Okay, so that's all we need is 30 minutes of energy around your tables. Each of your tables will be facilitated by one of our amazing uh, youth facilitators. So each of your tables is going to be facilitated, and I want to, as quickly as possible, run from challenge to success to solution. Okay? Once we're done with that process, we will report back, and we will, we will see what the next steps for this are beyond this room. Okay? So over to you, youth facilitators, on your tables. 30 minutes. Problem, success, solution. All right, everyone, we have a buzz in the room. That's what we're looking for. Very good. So thank you all. I mean, that was an incredibly difficult task. Uh, 30 minutes, such a broad subject, uh, and to go through the speed design process. What we're going to do now is we're going to ask for... Um, our youth facilitators at each table, they have one minute per table to provide everyone else in the room with a quick overview, super quick overview of the discussion that was had, some of your key takeaways, and some of the solutions that came out of it. Um, yes, Claudia. Yes, 
You. Uh, okay. Shall I hold that? You can hold that. So this group really did a very good job. Uh, it was really a team in all the world. Like everybody was discussing, and Adrian was putting all the ideas already. So the challenge that they identified were divided in many groups, but with some of our specifications inside them. And the first one is going back to and staying connected first. The need and the desire for education, we discussed a lot the need to promote development in the, in the places, that is a main problem, because le people leave the city or the, the rural areas because they lack for the, of the things that they want to have, not because there is no development in this poor, etc. Next one is living in a new culture is a challenge for the people that is moving because of cultural acceptance because changing behavior, because they are in a new environment and it changed all the, the, the things they are used to, so it provokes that change. Uh, the next one is self-identity, and because how Armand um, Mohammed said that he was uh, seen as a foreigner and that also alters your behavior. The next one is social readiness, uh, there was talking about that the process that is going to continue happening and how can you uh, prepare the society to be used to this and do it in a good way. The next one is yeah, land ownership. Yeah, that's a very uh, big challenge because when you are migrating from one place to another, you don't feel attached to a land. So if you don't feel attached to a land, how can you really want to do good things for this place, new place, because you don't feel attached. Like your land is far away, you want probably to make changes for your own land that is far away, you're living away. So that's a big challenge. Next one is the social community conflict. We were um, discussing a little bit the, the migration that is happening because of civil war or civil conflicts. Also, it's an important thing, not mainly related to climate change, but it's important to consider. And well, climate change and the natural disasters and the things related to natural resources that are going, we are going to face this more in the future, as we already mentioned, is going to be one of the biggest challenges in the future. So why don't we now just jump to some of the solutions? Yeah, yeah. that's a good thing, because when we were trying to think how can heaven look like, which was the second question, we were already talking about the solutions. So the solutions first come from the policy part, what can be uh, about changing the tax incentives that the government gives, the loans, we, we were discussing about microfinance because in rural areas you don't have many financial tools to ensure uh, your ideas to start a good um, business or investment, so that has to change, uh, which also is related to subsidies, uh, perverse uh, subsidies that can sometimes be against the development of rural areas, and we discussed a little bit about large-scale and small-scale agriculture, and yeah, that's that. Another one is about sensitize people about the importance to stay in a land and not migrating without convincing them, because we, we say that the freedom of choosing where to move or not must be maintained. Next one is capacity building in the, in the rural areas, so people can start having their own skills to really change the place where they are living without the need to leave, you know, make the place that they want where they are, so capacity building. And creating value in a place which is again with um, pro promoting development in a place which has to do a lot with creating value in a place, promoting the investment, the local investments in a place um, uh, another another solution that we talk is sustainable tourism that is already happening and we think that has to be promoted more. Yep. Thank you very much. Amazing way. We did that in half an hour. Unbelievable. Thirty minutes of discussion. Renata, super quickly, if you could just kind of give us highlights, same kind of structure, highlights of some of the challenges, and then highlights of some of the solutions. Yeah, I'm going to be very quickly. So we talked about the challenges and they mainly arise from the causes and consequences of migration. We first talked about how there's this problem of feeling always connected with home. 
Um, but there's also transportation, technology, and infrastructure flaws that come in the way. Um, there is the, uh, talking about the causes, there is this um, dissatisfaction peeling and being unhappy with the current state where, where, you're, where you're living. Um, communi uh, yeah, there's also a problem of communicating desires. You might be wanting to migrate, but you're not able to communicate those desires, but because the people in your environment might be constraining you to do, that, to do so. Um, so we're always in a, in a search of, of something different. And um, yeah, there are also language barriers, um, inter intergenerational concerns, identity loss, uh, racism, profession challenges as well, how from one uh, place to another there are many profession and status that can be really changed because of perception. And then we talked about success and how would the ideal world would look like for migration and we really came up with a very um, synthesized way to look at it. If you migrate from point A to point B, the really ideal way to look at it would be that the uh, benefits would be the same from migrating like vice versa from point B to point A and to really obtain the same benefits from both places, um, being different or not. And for that, we, we thought that uh, the, way, the best way to achieve it would be by integrating migrants with, with citizens and really uh, sharing and um, exchanging experiences. Um, knowledge transfer as well, either it's good or bad, we should always um, express these experiences, um, create resources and systems um, to get from point B, would, which would be the worst place, to point A. Um, isolate migration from politics that shouldn't be a topic that politicians uh, would be like able uh, or felt free like to talk about and um, ju just like stop projecting like an ideal society you know like each country has each uh, like each set of values and everybody's like entitled to have them um, thank you so That's brilliant. I love I love your ideal. A to B equals B to A. <laughs> Something kind of wonderfully mathematical about it. <laughs> Tom, over to you. All right. So, hey everyone. So in our, in our round table, we divided our poster into two. We have the challenges that people face due to migration, and then the solutions that we have put forth to try tackle and mitigate the challenges that have come. So mainly we divide it into two kind of categories. The problem that's come up already, that was social integration that migrants face in the new, in the new land, trying to integrate in a new society with a new culture, with their new ideals, and how do we make sure that they properly integrate and they're, they're properly able to continue their livelihood uh, without too much, uh, too, many, too much discrimination or social hostility. And then the climatic adaptation. We, we, were, we had a few points in our round table where, for example, some migrants who come from an area, uh, um, rural areas perhaps, and then are faced with much less pollution or much less other environmental issues that are in their area, and they move to another area where pollution is much stronger and much more prevalent. Now this can take an effect on their health, and migrants can then, and then the process of migrant integration can be inhibited. So what solutions did we put forward? First of all, government policy has to be much more stronger and much more relevant when it comes to climatic migrants. This was a point that was raised in the round table that governments at this current stage uh, um, usually have a general, a general policy for migrants and don't properly delve into the differences and the nuances of this issue, such as the economic migrants and the climatic migrants, and then those uh, of migrants who are necessarily fleeing conflict or other sorts um, of hostilities, so government policy has to be much more stronger to affirm and uphold um, the proper integration of migrants. Secondly, we discussed this, that one of the most effective ways that we've seen until today is, well, what we're doing right now, what GLF is doing, is that on the ground, person to person, um, interactions that are this platform gives you the, uh, the ability to talk one-to-one -one and create this dialogue. And once you bring people, migrants, and then local communities who, who are, f are fear for the unknown, um, or fear for not knowing what the other expects or where he comes from, they can talk and meet each other, set aside their differences and discuss 
the consequences of really what's happening to the migrants and how also the local communities are reacting to that migration. So we have one of the solutions specifically, more specifically, we have through social media. Social media has a very big role to play in bringing people together and getting a big message out. Just ask the social media here at GLF. Um, and then we have the better integration, uh, more cohesive integration of uh, kind of uh, awareness in the local communities in their curriculum. Okay, uh, kids from a very young age need to be able to understand the conse the consequences and the, uh, um, the the obstacles that migrants face on a day to day basis, especially those they, that they face on a day to day basis as a result of their climatic uh, climatic exodus. We, um, and then finally, we have the empowerment of current networks. Uh, this was missed mostly a point made about the bureaucracy that exists, and that not, instead of uh, uh, adding more and more organizations and more and more grassroots initiatives, that instead we kind of focus and empower the already existing ones to reach out even further. And then finally, it's um, and this was a point that we kind of we took ideas from everyone here that we made it to one big point, was that the public needs to be stronger in placing pressure on their governments and in their respective institutions so that they can invest more and give more to building and improving the infrastructure. And then another point, a very strong point, about the supervision bodies. Who, who here is overseeing all these changes? Who here is monitoring and managing the proper integration of these migrants in their new community? And finally, who is overseeing the transparency and accountability of all this big, big process? So those are a few of the ideas, the challenges we put forward, and some of the solutions. Thank you, Tom. We're going to get you all out of here in time for the closing ceremony, uh, plenary, sorry, which lasts five minutes. So, Monica, soup quickly if you can. So, uh, so in our group, we, t we, uh, we talk about uh, uh, six main ch uh, challenges, but we focus more on education as one of the main challenges uh, that lead people to think about migration. And then um, uh, that's due to lack of funding and people also like, looking for desired jobs. And then we define success, um, um, which, uh, which is a balance, uh, which is a kind of balance which is the balance uh, between sustainability and opportunities, and also to uh, success for for, the, uh, for us means to provide equal standards uh, uh, in terms of living in both uh, rural and urban areas, and uh, which uh, just lead. I mean, uh, and then we said that uh, success it just depends on your personal priorities, uh, which made us think about redefining what does uh, success mean uh, to a, a person and uh, we we've come up with uh, solutions to the main challenge which is uh, uh, education and uh, we thought that we need to, to define values within ed education to uh, de-link uh, westernized perception about uh, success and we also need to create uh, more open uh, uh, a, uh, uh, spaces uh, for kids to be able to learn uh, uh, well. Uh, so we need to re systemize education. Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Amazing. Taya, over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. That was a really interesting um, discussion. It's too bad that it was only 30 minutes long because I think we can all agree that we could talk about these issues more, especially if we want to like just get down to the deep roots. But um, so we, we need to have these conversations, like not only amongst us, but with other people who are actually going to like help us create a real impact. Um, and I think we're a little short on time right now, but I would say that like, let's look for that impact. Um, let's look for just trying to, to, to make these things that we're talking about happen. Um, this year, well, we put this together, it, it's been rather short notice, but we're still going to include what we've all talked about in a blog. We're going to push that, and and we'd like you to help us with that if you're into it. So just thank you all for coming here, and and yeah, thank you for your presentation.